Since it's dark in here, I'm not going to have you open up a Bible this evening, so our, our scriptures will be up on the screen. But I just want to take a few moments here in this, this time that's precious. Here, the night before Christmas, that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And I want to talk to you, as you can see here, I want to talk about collisions. See, two weekends before we were heading to Alaska, we were going to move to Alaska. I was planning to preach a Sunday morning at the church where I was helping out as a youth leader, as a youth pastor. And the day before that Saturday, it had rained. It was raining all day. I mean, pouring rain. And that night, it chilled and cooled down to where there was snowed all night. The next morning I got up ready to head to that church to preach a sermon in there. The church was 45 minutes away from where we were living and on 20 minutes down the road I hit some black ice. My car spun and it spun me right into a telephone pole collision. I had a collision. In fact, my car was totaled, and there was no way I was going to make it to that church and preach that morning. It wasn't going to happen. So I called the pastor, and I uh, told him what happened, and he filled in for me that morning. But, but what a collision, and this, this collision messed up my day. It messed up my family's day. It messed up other people's day. It was a collision. And some of us here this evening We've experienced some crashes in our life. Maybe you've even had some crashes this last year. Probably over the last two years, right? We've experienced some crashes. I understand that Christmas can be, for some people, a difficult time, especially if you've lost someone or lost more than one person. It's hard. And I don't know what kind of trouble every single one of us has experienced, but I do know that the words Christmas and collision go together. They go together. You think about this. Mary wasn't planning to have her life interrupted when the announcement came that she was going to be pregnant with the Savior of the world. Right? Mary had a collision. We read about this in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what, was, what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Not only did Mary have a collision, but so did Joseph, right? Joseph had a collision. We see this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And it says, keeps going on, it says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
And when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And I know we've read these two verses, I just wanted to, or these two passages, and I wanted to focus on the collisions that Mary and Joseph had, but really what I want to focus on most tonight is one single verse, okay? And it comes from the Gospel of John. And while Luke and Matthew give us the details surrounding the birth of Jesus, John provides us with the meaning or the explanation of all of this. And John doesn't use a story or a narrative, but instead he gives us the theology behind the nativity. John 1.14 is an incredible verse because it describes this Christmas collision, another Christmas collision. And we see this in John 1, 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the, of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we have this collision, right? This collision of God and humanity, God and people. There's a story of a grandfather who was visiting his family. And his grandson was there as well. He he was there with the grandson and the family. And one time he walked into the family room and he saw this little toddler, his grandson, standing up in his playpen. And he was crying. His face was red and he was tear stained. And when little Jeffy saw his grandfather, his face lit up and his hands reached out and he asked, he was like, for help, he was pleading for help. He said, out, Papa, out. What grandfather could resist this kind of plea? And so he walked over to the playpen. He reached down to lift that little boy, his little buddy out of that playpen, out of captivity. And just then, Law and order came into the room. A dish towel in hand, and she spoke sternly, and she said, Jeffy, you know better. You're being punished. Leave him right there, Dad. And she marched right back out of the room. The grandfather didn't know what to do. Jeffy's tears and outstretched hands just tugged at his heart. But he didn't want to interfere with a mother's discipline either. He couldn't just stand being in that same room with his grandson and not being able to do anything for him. But he also just couldn't leave the room and just leave him and abandon his grandson. It'd be like he was a traitor. So he had an idea. Since he couldn't take Jeffy out of the playpen, he climbed right into the playpen with him. And that's a pretty good picture of what Jesus did for us. He climbed right in. He climbed in with us. See, the first part of verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh. This is the single most unique quality of Christianity that makes it different from all of the other religions in our world. God became flesh. Jesus, who's called the the visible Word of God, Theologians call this the incarnation. This is is what they call this truth. And so the infinite second person of the Trinity, who created all things according to John chapter 1, 1, he became a little baby. And that's a staggering thought, right? He became a little baby. And the Son of God, who has always existed, who was part of creation, didn't cease to be God when he became a man. He just added manhood. He didn't subtract deity. He was fully God and fully man. And so here was this collision of God and humanity. And it had its full expression in Jesus. See, God picked a look that we could understand by having his son be born as a human being. And we see this in how Jesus hung around a group of mainly fishermen, right? No doubt Jesus probably smelled a little bit like fish. His hands were probably callous from the years of of holding and handling rough timber and lumber. He was a human in every way that we are, but yet he was without sin. He lived a perfect life. 
And so the incarnation not only means that we can understand God better, but God understands us. Not only did He create us, but He lived as one of us. He became one of us. The message translation says John 1.14 this way, The Word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. For years, God moved into our neighborhood, right? The NIV says that Jesus made his dwelling among us, which literally means to make one's tent. And so when people go camping, if you've been camping, it's really hard to be private when you're camping, right? Everybody can see what's going on, knows what's happening there. And so to say that Jesus set up his tent among us means to be that he was on familiar terms with us. He wants us to be close. He wants a lot of interaction with us. In fact, dwelling is the same word for the word they use for tabernacle in the Old Testament. And the tabernacle was that portable tent that was set up where the glory of God dwelt in the days before they beat, or built the, ta- the temple that was in Jer- Jerusalem. Excuse me. But the tabernacle was called the tent of meeting. We see this in, in Exodus 33. Verse 7, so Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting corresponds to Jesus dwelling among us. See, the tabernacle was God's dwelling place. God lived in the midst of the Israel camp, making his throne between the cherubim and the mercy, on the mercy seat. God had his dwelling place also in the body of Jesus. The tabernacle was the place where God met his people. In the same way, but in a much deeper sense, Jesus is the place where we meet God today. The tabernacle was the place where the sacrifices were made. That the animals were were killed and their blood became the atonement that covered the sins of the people. And so it is with Jesus. His cross became the altar where he was slain where his blood was shed, and where complete and total covering atonement for sin was made. And so the first collision is between God and humanity, God and people, and it's expressed precisely in Jesus, whom we celebrate. The second collision I want to talk about real brief, briefly tonight is this collision between grace and truth. We see it here. Um, and again, this is exhibited perfectly in Jesus. But you see this in John 1.14. It's the last part there. It says, Who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, the Apostle John knew Jesus just about as well as anybody else did, right? He spent a lot of time with Jesus. And when he was thinking of ways to describe what Jesus is like, John said, I'll tell you this, he's full of grace and truth. One translation says it this way, he is generous inside and out from the start to the finish. And he's true from start to finish. Grace and truth are, con- are, are two concepts that, that don't often appear together. Grace and truth. As humans, what we tend to do is we tend to go to one side or the other of grace and truth. We're not right in the middle of those things. Because if we stress grace, we can be too quick to forgive people and cut people slack. And if we go to the other part, we judge too harshly. We make forgiveness almost impossible. But Jesus was one full of grace. Jesus dealt graciously with the people that he met. He especially did this with those who were reeling from some moral or physical train wreck in their life. Grace is overwhelming kindness, goodwill, and favor. It's a special kind of tenderness. Like parents brought their children to Jesus and he blessed them. The leper came wanting to be healed and Jesus made him clean. The woman caught in adultery was not condemned by him, but was instead given grace. And then he, she was told to go and sin no more. The disabled, the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the down and outers grabbed every chance possible to be around Jesus, to be near him. And so he was full of grace. But also, secondly, he was full of truth. 
Jesus was truth personified because he was fully, he was perfection. He was knowledge. He was wisdom. He was excellence. All that he spoke was truth. All that he did was truth. All that he thought was truth. He even described himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And because he's full of truth, he spoke truth to those who needed to hear it. Which is basically all of us, right? (laughs) And with Jesus, though, you can always count on truth and grace. He tells the truth about your life and your situation, and then he gives grace that causes us to, or causes him to stick with us no matter what, all the way. Jesus loves me enough to spell out my sinfulness. I love how Max Lucado says it, and he says it here. I'll put it up on the screen for you. He says, God loves me just the way I am. That's the grace. But he loves me too much to let me stay that way, and that's the truth. Though nothing and through nothing that I have done, Jesus offers his incomparable kindness and forgiveness by sacrificing himself as the penalty for my own sin and your sin and rebellion. And because he was full of grace, he died for you and for me while we were still yet sinners. And because he's full of the truth, he's able to pay for our sins completely. And so at Christmas, where we take the time to celebrate the birth of Jesus, we're reminded of the Word of God that became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus has the perfect ability to tell us the awful truth about ourselves while holding up His grace at the same time. And so the manger is filled with the awesomeness of God's grace, but we're also reminded of the terrible truth that because of our sin, Jesus Christ had to come and die for us. And because He's full of grace, we can come to Him just the way that we are. Because of His grace, we don't have to clean up our lives to come to Him first. But because he's also full of the truth, you can come in complete confidence knowing that he will keep his promise to forgive you and to grant you eternal life. See, that's grace and that's truth. Without, being, without those both working together, we wouldn't have either of those things. And because he's God in the flesh, there's no conflict in that collision. And then just one last one real quickly. It's the collision between self and the Savior. And the final collision is found in this middle section of John 1, 14, where it says, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son. And so John is here, he's using the third person pronoun. He says we, and he's using it to show us that the disciples had the privilege of seeing the glory of God as exhibited in the life of Jesus. They saw it in Jesus. The word seen here is a rich word, which means to carefully scrutinize. It's the idea of searching or of examining in order to make a decision here, to understand. And on Christmas Eve, we are all invited to consider the Christ of Christmas, to study and see the Savior of the world who came to, and when we do that, we actually have to come to some conclusions when we look at him. You can only learn by looking. John became a witness because he, was allowed, he just allowed himself to be wowed by the incarnation, God in flesh. In fact, no one who ever met Jesus stayed the same. No one did. And so this Christmas, we're faced with a collision. It's the collision between you, your, it's you yourself, and the, with the Savior. And so what do you see when you look into the manger? What do you see? Do you see the glory of God? Do you see tenderness and truth? Do you see deity, God, in diapers? 
See, the real conflict is one that's deeply personal. Some of us have been hit with some pretty hard things over this year, and maybe we're still reeling and and hurting from those things in our lives. Maybe you've been keeping Jesus at an arm's length because of the pain and the hurt or, uh, or just something to happen with somebody else. And you don't want Jesus near you right now. You're hurting from all of that. Others, you probably know what you need to do, but you just don't want to surrender yourself to the Savior. You're still trying to do it all by yourself. Well, the message of Christmas is that you don't have to do it by yourself any longer. In fact, you can't. Jesus is here. He's God in the flesh. He's set up his tent among us so that we can get to know him and forever be changed by him. See, on this night, let's remember that Jesus is always ready to let us, you know, to to receive him. So what are you running into today? What are you colliding? What is that collision that you have in your life today? What is it? What have you been hitting that you can't move? Jesus is God and humanity wrapped into one. In him is grace and truth, and they're fully realized so that you and I can respond and submit to him even tonight. Let me ask you, what are you waiting for? Take this moment to just close here. If you want to just come and just play softly, you can. We have collisions in life that we hit that we just run up to or you run up against but the main one that we have and the one that we're talking about here tonight is we can't do it on our own we cannot earn our way to heaven we cannot make it there by trying to be good enough we needed a savior that's why jesus came i want to ask that everybody just bow their heads here this evening And I want you to think about Jesus this evening. Maybe you're colliding into something that's just not moving for you tonight. Maybe right now in your life. Maybe one, it's... You're trying to do all of this on your own. And Jesus, what we celebrate, Jesus says you don't have to. That you don't have to do anything but accept him and follow him. Maybe this Christmas, this night, this week, this year, you've had some hard things happen in your life and it just doesn't seem like anything's getting better. And that's the collision that's happening in your life. Would you just take that before God this evening? Would you ask for his help and his wisdom in that situation? Maybe it's a a relationship in your life that's been that's been hard, that's been hurt over this year. God's saying, I want to bring healing into that. Maybe one you have to forgive right now. Maybe it's just healing that you need in your life tonight. Would you trust God? Would you ask God to continue to heal you? Work a miracle in your life. He is a God who heals. He's a God who has all power. So whatever it is this night, would you make a decision? I keep running into this thing. It's not moving, God. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you and see how you're going to work in my situation, how you're going to lead me through this situation. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you are God who who came. You collided with us. You came from heaven. You sent Jesus the Son to come here. 
that we might see you, might know you. God, I pray it is, whatever it is that those of us here tonight, those that are watching tonight, Lord God, whatever it is that there, we're colliding into, God, I pray that we would get, turn that to you. We allow you to lead us through it, Lord God. You give us wisdom, God. I pray where people need healing tonight, God, you'd be your, you'd be their healing. God, where people need wisdom, you would speak wisdom into their lives through your word and through your spirit, God. God, where people need a miracle in their lives, God, I pray you bring miracles, God. I pray where people just need you, Lord, you are near. And you do not leave. So, God, I pray that in our collisions, we would turn to you, trust you, and see you alive in our lives, maybe like we've never had before. We thank you that you came to be our salvation, to be our way, our direction, our light, and that we can go forth as your followers, as your people, as Christians, to be that same light. And we just give you glory, honor, and praise tonight, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And so in your collision, go forth and, and just let God take care of it. Let God lead you through it. Trust him. Know that he loves you. That's why he came. It's what we celebrate. His love, his joy, his peace. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Have a great Christmas celebration. If you're around, hopefully we'll see you Sunday. But have a great night. Merry Christmas.